greatest marine wilderness in Africa. How did we get to that name? Why is Algoa Bay the greatest marine wilderness in Africa? This is where it all started uh, 30, 31 years ago. We started the Baywatch project and I had this idea to try and protect and look after Algoa Bay. And I used to go around borrowing money from people or bumming money from people. And that takes a lot of time. We started Raggy Charters. We made the company as efficient and as profitable as possible. And now we've got money to hold these, uh, all these festivals and to print all these pictures and what have you. I mean, just that, that 75,000 rands worth of printing, you, you know, you lose it. So that's where, that's where the money goes if you come and do a cruise with us. Um, then we became a whale heritage site a few years back. That was during COVID. I was flying back from giving my talks in Namibia and I got to Cape Town and Cyril decided that by the next day, no more than 50 people and our staff were 53 people. So that was a bit of a disaster. Then uh, as you may, may know, our Goa Bay is a hope spot. Uh, Dr. Sylvia L pronounced that. We launched that in 2013 because of the amazing diversity that we have here in our bay. Um, a little bit about why, why, why do we have, for example, 28,500 dolphins that use our bay? It's all about food. Where does that food come from? Well, if you look at that picture there, you'll see there's a current that comes down from, um, from, from, the, uh, from the tropics, which is not doesn't have a lot of nutrients in it. Hot water, warm water doesn't have nutrients. So where do the nutrients come from? Well, underneath that current is the Antarctic or the polar currents. And that is very, very nutrient rich. So that gets brought up from the Antarctic. It flows under those currents. And this part here, that is the, the continental shelf. And that current goes along there. And what happens when it flows along the shelf? It causes upwelling. So it causes that cold water to come up the continental shelf, which is 50 kilometers from us, and blow over Algoa Bay, the photic level, where, where things can start reproducing. Right? Nutrients, spores of the plankton, and you get amazing plankton blooms in Algoa Bay. That's just, um, those are uh, the paths of, of the whales, but that is Algoa Bay. So on the point there, Cape Reef over to Woody Cape. It's like about um, 90 kilometers across. It's one of the largest bays in Africa. So this is where the nutrients come into and it starts off with the phytoplankton. That's the plant plankton. Right, there's more plants in the sea than there are on land. Did you know that? <coughs> All right, and if you've got lots of plants, it feeds the animals. And uh, not all the plankton is good. That is something called red tide. Do you remember that time in Port Elizabeth we had red tide? And um, that has now come in and actually clogs up the fish's gills and can actually kill them. So it's not always a, it's not always a, a, a pleasant thing. Right, prawns, close. That's krill. That's what the whales eat. These amazing animals that are coming past, that's very prolific. Um, in the Antarctic and closer to your home here, we've got uh, more, that's zooplankton. So it's all these little animals that we can't see. And that is the basis of the food chain. That's why something like bunkering in Algoa Bay, the ship-to-ship -ship fuel transfers, we don't know what toxins are actually going into the water. We don't know how it's affecting the plankton. We even got a plankton scientist out here this year from Italy. She's over there somewhere. And we were going to study the plankton, but it's too short-lived to actually show us what toxins are in it. All right, and it costs hundreds of thousands of rand and we're not quite in that league yet, but we'll, we'll come up with a plan. That's, uh, so that's, anyone know what that is? That's overseas, all right, for those of you that haven't traveled. That's Algoa Bay and those are the bird islands on the eastern side <laughs> off Woody Cape. And if you have a look there, you'll see there's a school of little white dots there. That's a school of common dolphins, and that's our boat going around the common dolphins. They feed a lot in that area. That's what Bird Island looks like. Have a look at the gannet colony on there. There's 250,000 gannets. It's the largest gannetry on the planet. Right, so we're very lucky we've got these things. With penguins, 
it's another sad story, but we'll get to that. Why gannets are so successful is they can fly down to Mossel Bay for lunch and then fly back the next day. Penguins can't do those distances. Anyone know where that is? That's Woody Cape. All right. That's the other end of the bay that no one goes to because there's no roads there. It's a shifting sand dunes. Same place. Right. Then we get into, let's start with the boring stuff like birds. All right. This was taken about a month ago. These birds are called Cory Shearwaters. And they've been, I've nev in 30 years, I've never seen so many in our Goa Bay. We've had the biggest sardine run on record this year. And we had a BBC film crew here filming the whole thing. So in a couple of years' time, because that's how long it takes, you'll be able to watch that in your lounge on TV. And it was all shot here. There's Jake, our captain over there. He, he spent most of the time with them doing stuff for three weeks. So this, this is them. Corey Shearwaters, if you're, if you're a twitcher, you like birds, that's a, that's a really cool bird. And they come all the way from, from the sub-Antarctic. You know, they'll do 20, 30,000 kilometers to feed their chicks. They, they, they're breeding birds, you know. Um, what else? You know what that is? That's an albatross. Uh, that's a juvenile Indian yellow nose. They nest somewhere near New Zealand, and they come all the way to, to our house. Yeah. That was taken in the continental shelf, so about 50 kilometers south of Cape Receive. That's where the warm water is. That's one taking off. As you know, albatrosses have got the, the longest wingspan of any bird. You'll see them compared to the gunners. They don't flap. They just move. They, it's absolutely, absolutely incredible. Uh, that, is the, that is the wandering albatross. That has got a 3.3 meter wingspan. Can you imagine that? So from here, that's its wingspan. I mean, that's crazy. And they all live here. They're all just off here. Would we see them on the shore? No. They never, ever come to shore. And why they do, I don't know. I think because there's no food for them. They're they eating plankton and, and bits of food that they can get. That one, white and petrol. I was filming and I thought, you know, I just... Put your wing in the water. Come on, just and it did. Just went shh, like that. I managed to get that. And uh, how did I get that shot? Okay, well, we were out one day, 50 kilometers off, and we got there, and there was a, a, a between a five and a seven meter swell. Okay, that's huge. Those big container ships were rocking. So we were in the bottom of the swell, and the bird was on the top of the swell. So I managed to get it like like head on. There's a nasty, that's called a giant petrel. And giant petrels eat other seabirds. So they eat all the little storm petrels and stuff. They're quite, uh, well, I guess that's just how it is, you know. Then we get on to Bird Island. That's, that's a gannet coming into land on the colony. You can see they've got uh, the black ones are the, are, the, are the hatchlings. They're probably a few months old. And what it does is the parent comes in, it sees where its nest is. It makes a turn and comes in. And if you look at that one, you can see it's air brakes. <laughs> see there? Flaps down at the back. Landing gear. Those flaps. And it'll come to a dead stop and it'll just fall down. And then everything around it tries to pick it. It's quite a, it's quite a palaver. Yeah, that was one night. Uh, I was very lucky. I was, I was married to a... a a French researcher, so I managed to get access to the islands, and I would be the assistant. And obviously, most of the time, I'd be taking photographs. But uh, yeah, a night on one of those islands is absolutely—it's like living in a in a in a flippin' blue planet documentary. It's absolutely amazing. There, that was uh, recently. The, the gamut numbers are, are doing actually doing very well. They 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 managing to 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 hold. The, the, the boys from Bird Island, that's where the, all of that took place. <laughs> okay, and that's gannets when, they, when they're feeding. So, so what's happened in that picture is that the common dolphins actually <coughs> come across a school of, say, 200 tons of, of sardines. They will then take about a ton off the school and surround it and bring it towards the surface. They can't control the whole school, so they'll control a part of it. 
And when it gets closer to, to the surface, these gamuts will dive. You'll see them coming depending on how deep the fish is. The higher they come from, the deeper the fish. And they can get 15 meters on a single dive. Okay, and they hit the water of speeds of up to 100 kilometers an hour. <coughs> so why don't they break their necks? Good question. Because they've got airbags. They really have. They've got subcutaneous, under the skin, airbags that absorb that, that shock on cotton. And look how many there are. And they don't hit each other. I mean, why that is sad. Every now and again we get one with a broken wing and we take it to Sam Cobb and they just, they can't fix it. But they keep it alive. And uh, yeah, they can eat quite big prey. That's, if you guys are any fishermen here, elf, you've heard of elf or shad, they call it in the town. That's a shad. That's quite a, that's quite a big fish. But it's got to swallow it quickly, otherwise you, you're going to have to share it with the, with the other ones. So they've got these most beautiful colored eyes. I'm, I must be like a whale because I'm colorblind. So I don't know, I only have one cone in my eye. But Okay, so there's the... <laughs> Lighthouse built in 1854, the fourth lighthouse to be built in South Africa. All right, and um, it's automated. And now the penguins make their appearance. So I just spoke to Professor Lorian Pichigrew this morning. Uh, the penguin numbers on Bird Island have stayed pretty stable. They're at 1,600 breeding pairs. And you multiply that by two and a half because half a one is not breeding. So there's about 3,200, almost 4,000 penguins on bird. On St. Croix Island, there used to be 60,000 or 20,000 breeding pairs. She only counted 800 this year. So that's, and that's to her and the Department of Environmental Affairs. They, they're the ones that carry that out. Anyway, that's what you call a bluey. So when the penguin gets to its final stage of molting, they molt all the time when they get to that stage they can then go into the water and they can feed on their own. Mm. How long does that take? Uh, to become a bluey, about 40, anything from 40 to 80 days. Mm. All right, this was, uh, I also managed to get a few nights on, on St. Croix Island, which is the one that you can see close to the port. Um, yeah, I will never get those pictures again, unfortunately. The main reason, of course, is overfishing. The, the, the bunkering things, yes, and the egg collecting in the past, but the big oil spills, and now the depletion of stocks. But the good thing is, is that because of all our research on penguins, the whole area from Kucha all the way to Woody Cape around the corner has, has been declared a marine protected area. So nobody can go and catch fish in there. So hopefully. And that's what you guys support. Okay, coming on the cruises, making money available, helping the scientists, collecting the data. Anybody know what's happening there? Am I actually doing this wrong? Can I do that? There we go. Oops. Vili? Okay. What's going on there? Feeding off the sardines. Feeding off the sardines. All right, that was something that has never been described. Uh, myself and Professor Peter Ryan, we wrote the first paper on that, scientific paper. These penguins do what the common dolphins do. They break off an even smaller part of the, of the shoulder fish, and then they surround it. They surround the fish, and they bring it towards the surface. And they feed from the outside. They keep it under control. They're bringing it up there. You can see that. And they always go clockwise. They never go the other way around. Don't know why that is. And there's 17 other species of birds that are allowed to eat because of what the penguins are doing. So you take the penguins out the equation, which is what's happening now. These other birds can't feed efficiently. And those little ones at the top are terns. Common terns. Look at that. That's pretty cool. That's... Uh, African penguins, all right, they're quite small, half a meter in, in height, compared to your big, um, uh, the big penguins, which are up to one and a half, 1.2 meters. And that's what, uh, in the 90s, that's what the rafts used to look like. A group of penguins swimming is called a raft, okay? And what they do is they get into the water there, and you can see they're busy preening. They've got an oil gland on the base of their tail, they take their beaks, they rub it in the oil, they rub that oil all over their feathers, and that waterproofs them. So they trap a layer of air between the skin 
and the feathers. It's like a thermos flask that keeps your coffee hot. And that air around them insulates them and they can stay in the water for forever, <laughs> for weeks at a time. Whereas other birds like cormorants, they get cold because they don't have that. They've got to get out and that's why you see them sitting like that. They've got to heat up. Right, so those are the houses there where the guano collectors used to live. That was 2008. And this was 2000. I took this in the year 2000. How, what's that? 23 years ago. There were 60,000 penguins on St. Croix Island. And that is why the next picture I'm going to show you is why if we don't look after and protect our Goa Bay, this is what happens. And this is what is happening now. That's the same place. All right, so in Houston, we've got a problem here. Okay, you guys have got to start getting involved in stuff. All right, first thing is boycott Coca-Cola with their plastic shit, all right? <laughs> I was going to have a demonstration now, but it's not a good idea because this is a positive thing. So we'll catch us in a week or two's time. All right, then we've got these guys. Is Greg Hoffmeyer here, the seal guy from Bayworld. He always complains because I never put seals in the presentations. <laughs> so this is at Bird Island, all right? This is why the white sharks come to Bird Island, all right? They come to eat the seals when they're learning to swim. They don't come there because we are putting chum in the water to attract the sharks. We're attracting the sharks from the bottom, 12 meters up to the surface that we can see them going past a cage. We're not attracting them to Bird Island or to Algoa Bay. Read the science. It's all I'll say for now. That was with a film crew one day. We had this five meter swell. That's where they, that's why they get washed off. That's why those little pups end up getting washed up along that woody cape section of beach. And in the old days, historically, brown hyenas used to come and feed off those little pups. But then the farmers, of course, have shot them all. And look how dexterous they are. I mean, no other animal that I know can turn itself in a, in a somersault into that. Look how it's bent its whole body. Extremely efficient predators. Well, these flippin' guys are smart. And there we go. We've got sexual dimorphism. So there's the male on the left, female, and you've got the little pup that's now suckling on her. And eventually she's going to get tired of it, and she's going to make it go and catch its own food. And that's when Mr. Great White is waiting. Oh. All right, play the Jaws music. And uh, South African fur seals. You know what the difference is between a fur seal and a sea lion? They look exactly the same. Fur seals have got two layers of fur, and that's why they were hunted. Sea lions, only one. So sea lions were hunted for their fat. And uh, that was my octopus teacher, my ex-octopus teacher. That's their favorite meal. They're flicking a poor old octopus around. And uh, they learn quickly. So with all this bunkering and the increased uh, ship traffic in Algoa Bay, these guys, that's the bulbous bow. So these ships, they don't have just a front, a straight bow. They have that bulb, and that pushes the water so that it can travel easily through the water. And these guys are quickly onto it. And yeah, but you won't believe it, but this was, ship was hijacked by the seal. You can see in total command there. And uh, off they go. And 80% uh, of a seal's diet, I'm talking under correction, is, is baiting anchovy, sardine, mast bunker. But every now and again, they target these, uh, are the blue rays. And they're in about 30 to 50 meters of water. So they go a long way down and pretty dark there. And then they bring these rays up. Uh, and then they, they flick them on the water to break them into pieces. They even take electric, electric rays. Okay, just very briefly, um, before I get into the whales and dolphins, that's all the whales and dolphins on the planet. There's about 85 different species, all right? And they're called cetaceans. It sounds like a long word. It is cetacean. It comes from the Greek ketos, which means a large sea monster or animal, cetacean. And they split into two. You heard earlier uh, speakers talking about the baleen whales and the toothed whales. Okay, Mr. Seti and Odonta Seti. What is that? Okay. 
Okay, so this is, this is a baleen plate. All your big whales have these, and it's like 300 on each side of the jaw. And this hair at the back here is what they use to filter the plankton out the water. All right, you can imagine this like a big sieve. I'll show you some pictures just now. It's made of keratin, the same stuff as your fingernail, and the same stuff as rhino horn. So if you grind this up into a powder, you could probably say that it's rhino horn, and no one would even know. So it's the same stuff, and it also does nothing. All right, <laughs> so here are the baleen whales, the big ones. There's the blue whale there, this guy, humpback whale, that's the fin whale, biggest, second biggest animal ever existed, the bride's whale, minke whale. Um, they're all raucles, which means they've got these throats that expand and contract. These guys here, the right whales, the right whales don't have that expanding throat because they've just got massive big mouths. I'm going to try and see that. Mm, the second one from the top there, that's a bowhead. I'm going up to Alaska to see if I can't catch up with some Eskimos and let them show me some of those. All right, and then we have the toothed whales, whales with teeth. Toothed whales only have one blowhole. The baleen whales have two. All right, and here is the biggest. You've seen the other talks, your sperm whale, this one here. And these guys here, they're called beaked whales. Beaked whales because they've got quite a long rostrum and they've got these funny little teeth and they the deep divers of the sea. The Cuvier's beaked whale has been clocked at four kilometers. Four thousand meters under the surface where they hunt giant squid and things. Can you imagine the evolutionary that's gone on there to let them do that? Sperm whales, who they always thought were the deepest divers, um, they only get down to three kilometers. Killer whales up to a kilometer. All right, and this is, from a, this is from a sperm whale too. So this has been down to all sorts of depths, catching squid, crazy stuff. So when, so why is a killer whale a dolphin and not a whale? Killer whales are the biggest member of the dolphin family. Any cetacean, any one of those animals that gets longer than four meters gets called a whale. Okay, because it's a size thing, guys. It's all about size. <laughs> all right. And uh, pilot whales as well, and the false killer whales, they're all members of the dolphin family. Okay, so there again, continental shelf, 50 kilometers off here. There's a sperm whale. You can see it's got only one blowhole on the top of its head. It's... On the surface, it does about 20, 30 breaths, gets, recharges its muscles with oxygen, and boop, <coughs> off it goes. Last blow, tail up, and down they go. So we've got them here. Uh, historically, they were hunted off Port Elizabeth as well. And that's their little cousin. That's called a pygmy or a dwarf sperm whale. See the little teeth? And they're also very deep divers. I've only ever seen them once on the surface. And that was just off here, just off Cape Receive. Uh, there's, uh, there's one of your beaked whales. That's a Blanville's beaked whale. Uh, it washed up at Sedwana Bay. Um, and uh, death unknown. And you can see those are the funny little teeth. Uh, the, only the males have teeth. And they use that when they're fighting uh, amongst each other. They don't use it uh, for feeding. When they want to catch a squid, they actually suck it in. They create a vacuum, and boop, down it goes. All right, then now uh, southern right whales um, that we get in our Goa Bay. Um, historically, these animals always used to come to North End. When I started whale watching, there was up to 40 of them in the North End, all the way down to Kucha. We've now got all this noise, and these ships... They make a lot of noise. They've got generators that run on there. You know, it's like cutting down a rainforest and wondering why all the orangutans are dead because you've destroyed the habitat. When you put noise into the marine environment, you, you mess up the habitat. They can't live with noise. They need noise to communicate, to feed, all of these things. So these ships have got them to move. So if you come looking for whales with us, we all go down to Sunday's River in the marine protected area. 
That's why you've got to have these marine protected areas. They can now go, and they do that. Last year, Jake and I were taking tourists down there. They were there for three months until that calf gets to eight meters. And at eight meters, boof, they're gone. They've gone back home. Female needs to eat. She doesn't eat while she's here. There's no food. And uh, look how nice and close they come in. Right, uh, just off, um, off the pier there. Every now and again, you have a, a white one, a white calf that's born. Um, unfortunately, it's not an albino. It's, called, it's just born that color. It's called brindle. And eventually, after time, its color will change. And it'll, it's adult, it'll become a brindle. But it looks pretty cool. There's one from last year. Those are the um, sand dunes to the east of Kucha. Those white patches that you see on the adult, those are called callosities. They, um, that's not one. <laughs> it's a barnacle from a whale. Whale barnacles only found on whales, on nothing else. And they transferred from the adults to the little ones. You've got whale lice. So on those callosities, which is like a wart, you'll have this lice that grows and eats the dead skin. And it gets transferred to the calf at birth. Looks terrible. That's a close-up. And that's what an adult brindled whale or an adult white whale will look like. It will grow into that. There, those two holes, that's its blow holes. And you can see the top, the top jaw. It's very, it's very narrow along there. Okay? And the bottom jaw is, is huge. All right, that's at North End. And you know what always amazes me is here we are. There's like 10, 15 whales all mating. Okay? And there's the freeway. And there's all these people going past, totally oblivious to what's happening to these mating whales, like probably half a kilometer from where they're driving. So it's really, really incredible. And you know what happens with these whales is that when they get here, the, the males have swum about 2,000 to 3,000 kilometers to mate. All right? And they will all mate with a receptive female. All of them. It's, it's run on what's called sperm competition. So the one that makes the most sperm has the most chance of fathering the calf. After that, he's got nothing to do with the calf. But you can imagine after 3,000 kilometers, he's edging close to this woman and she says, now I've got a headache. You know, it's, it's not allowed in Wales. You can't have a headache. Anyway, she tries to float on the surface and they try and push her up, you know, push her over that they can mate with her. Anybody know what that is? That thing in the middle is a pink, isn't it? That's Moby's dick, all right? That's a whale's, a whale's penis. All right, and it's like a monkey's tail. It's prehensile. It moves around. It's look, looking for things, you know? It's crazy. <laughs> So there, there, those are the baleen plates. You can see on the top jaw, and that was the stuff that they used for just about everything, women's petticoats, umbrellas. You know, this, you know the term, stop wailing, you know, when a child is screaming, they say it's wailing. It's because they used to make whips out of whalebone and whip the kids with them. All right, that's where it comes from. And yeah, now that is a 60 ton animal in five meters of water and it's 14 meters long. How the hell does it manage to breach? Someone actually videoed. They swim sort of uh, parallel to the surface and at the last minute they, they flick themselves out like that. And that is a southern right with the calf in tow on the background. You can see that's down there past Kucha in that area. And the reason that they live or swim so close to shore is that the sound of the waves helps uh, camouflage the sounds of the mother talking to the calf because they're communicating all the time mm. and they whisper because if any killer whale worth his salt is coming past and he hears southern right whale calf he's in like a flash and that thing will be dead they drown them and they eat only the tongue oh. yeah. they're terrible things i tell you yeah And that was one sunset. Jake and I went out. There's the whale on the, on the right-hand side. 
Okay, Precif, it's always nice, it's always nice to have a lot, something in the background that shows you where that picture is taken. Because you see so many of these generic pictures, and they could be anywhere in the world. This is us, this is Cape Recife. It's a humpback, a uh, uh, southern rights fluke. There we go, breaching towards the lighthouse. That was the second, second lighthouse built in South Africa. See, they're blown. And that is one of, that's a southern <coughs> rights cousin. It's called a pygmy right whale. Pygmy right, you can see much smaller, little rostrum there, and the baleen plates look like this. See, that's how close they are together. So that's from a pygmy. This one's stranded in, uh, in Volfus Bay, in the lagoon there. Ha, ah, who knows what that is? Well, it's a whale. It's the smallest baleen whale that's a rorqual. So, why it's, it's called a minke whale. It's the smallest of them. They, the Japanese are still hunting these, all right? The, the Norwegians too. When the blowhole and your dorsal fin is out of the water at the same time, it's got to be one of the really small ones. That's, uh, that's a little calf that washed up. Um, very difficult to see these whales. And sorry about that, but I was quite a long way away. That's a minky breaching in Algoa Bay. So I managed to get that, but it was about, must have been about 300 meters off, so a bit blurred. That's what their baleen plates look like. Okay, so the smaller or the shorter the baleen plates, the bigger the food that they're eating. All right, so those, those plates are from a humpback. They'll be eating, you know, up to crawl about that size. And the really big, long baleen with the fine hair, they'll be used by the southern rights because they eat even smaller, smaller stuff. What's the, the marking there on the eye and just above? No, it's just, it just damaged it was dead and it was rolling around on the bottom, in the harbour actually. All right, anyone, that's Woody Cape again. You can see the coastal thicket there. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's my favourite whale. That's called a bride's whale, or it's pronounced brudus. It was, it was named after John Bride. He was the Norwegian twit that came and started whaling in South Africa. So they named that whale after him. And it's got a calf, and you don't often see that. You can see when the calf hits uh, the, the surface, it pushes its nose up at an angle. Look at that. That's cool, huh? Oh. Yeah. So these whales are very, very difficult to photograph and even to observe. When I first started running tours, I didn't even know that they existed. And the better you get at it, the more you look, the, the more you actually find. Okay, this is, when, this is when you can notice them. So now what's happened here is those dolphins have pushed all the bait fish into a ball and been eating, eating. They know they've got to hurry up. Because it's not long, as Julian was saying, and those things can smell or sense or what have you. And when those whales come to the scene, they take whatever's left. Plus, like a penguin or two or a gannet. Or, oh, shit, I just swallowed a shark. You know, they, do, they, have been, they have been known to swallow sharks. Look at that. Look, how, look at the rorqual effect. So those pleats are called rorqual pleats. It's from the old Norse, from the Viking. And it basically means bellows. That's what it's like. That's also been on the BBC. That was on Perfect Plan. No, that was on the migration of birds around the world. They were doing something on gannets, but they, they put that in. And uh, that was my first, one of my first pictures I ever took. I was so excited about this picture. And I called it the eye of the eye. And the reason is, is that the, the dolphins have made an eye. But if you look in the middle of the picture... Over here, you can actually see the eye. It was actually looking at us. So, yeah, really, but very bad light that day. And the other distinguishing feature about, I mean, there's Port Elizabeth. That's us. They've got three longitudinal ridges on the head over here. One, two, three. All your other whales only have one. And you can actually see the fish here. Look at that. I mean, 
they can increase their, their, their consumption by 20%, 20 times having that whole throat that distends out like that. And you know, it was only about five years ago that they realized how this whale did it. And they found an organ in its body that originates from the back molar. And that organ controls the opening of the mouth, all right, the opening of the pleats, the getting the baleen in the right place, pulling the tongue down and allowing it to gulp that whole lot of fish. Six, six years ago they discovered that. There's so much that we don't know about these animals. Um, we've had these researchers, Jake took them out, we had them about a month or so back. Uh, this is Dr. Gwen Penry and what they do is, there's so little known about these bride's whales that we need to just even know how many there are. So what we were doing, we photographed the dorsal fins and every dorsal fin is like a fingerprint. And then she decided it's time to put, uh, put loggers on. So that's what they were doing there. You've got to get up um, and whack that on. What Jake's guys were doing, they were doing, they were harpooning them. Excepting the harpoon's about the size of my finger and it's hollow. And it just takes a little skin sample out. And from that you know exactly what it's been eating, what sex it is, how much it's reproduced. You know a whole lot of stuff on that. Yeah, that's what it looks like. That's fun, it's really cool. And some of them are not all that fortunate. This is a bride's well that washed up just to the right, here at Willows. Um, and um, it was 14.67 meters. I think my son Jamie's here. Where is he at the back there? Somewhere. He was here that day. And uh, Herman, the, the, the manager, is phoned me. He said, Look, why don't you just bring your boat around and just pull it back into the sea? It's starting to stink. Okay, but it's a 20 ton whale. I mean, I would have never got that thing anyway. So I thought, I've got a better idea. And we put it in a hole, just up there. Put it on a flatbed in a hole. We then covered it with sand. That was like 15 years ago. It's ready to take out and assemble. Wow. So we're looking for volunteers <laughs> to come and do that. And we've been looking for a long time and we're not getting. We've already <laughs> taken one virtue. Oh, that's perfect. But you know, that's a job for an army of people and it's going to cost a lot of money. So maybe one day when I'm big, we can, we can try and do that. And this was taken, I took this uh, last, uh, two weeks ago. So proud of that. So that's, that's, um, that's summer strand. That's a bride's well, and that's the fish that it's eating. Obviously it swallowed lots, but some of it it didn't. I love it. I love that one. It's 30 years it took me to get that, that close, and PE. All right, and then we come to our friends, the humpbacks. This is where we are now at Willows. There's Cape Receive Lighthouse. So we'll probably may even start seeing some this afternoon. And uh, that's off Port Elizabeth. Um, that one's doing, we got that one to do backstroke, as you can see, <laughs> doing well. And that's where I was born, over there. That's the lighthouse, that's the Donkin. I was born in Parliament Street, number two, just there. And um, this is where the whalers used to sit and watch for the whales blowing. And then they would, um, they would call the whalers and then they would launch mainly out of the, um, out of the Barkins River estuary and go out and then hunt the whales. In fact, I saw my first one. I was 10 years old. I was at the room of, at the top in the Elizabeth Hotel. We used to sneak in there and steal the chips from that was behind this thing. We had a way of getting them out. And I remember I saw a little guy on his lila and I saw this whale getting closer and closer and suddenly he saw it. It was a southern right whale. He took off like there was an outboard motor on his little lila. <laughs> I think when he hit the shore, he, his arms were still going. And that's when I decided that I want to get closer to these animals. There's the stadium. Always nice to have that in the background. And uh, yeah, that's uh, the Campanile. So from 1820 settlers, this guy's tail slapping. I actually went to Portnet and said, I've got this picture, can I make you one you can put up in your office? And you know what they said? No. They said, oh, we don't have any space. And I thought, come on, you know, you... Yeah. That's, um, that's, so they all got different, look at that one's tail. And that's uh, St. Croix Island, that's where the Guano collectors used to live, scraping all the penguin, penguin um, droppings off the, off the island. That's Bird Island. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's difficult to get a picture of a whale breaching, but then to, to line everything up as well, it's, 
It's always the skipper. So the skipper on the boat, and purity is getting good at that lately. I just like, when we get to us, purity, it's all yours. And she's like, and she's, she's got it sorted. So it, it takes a lot of coordination between all the staff to actually get these pictures. This guy, yeah, he was, is Warren here? <laughs> Professor, where are you? Warren, the chopper, there? yeah, he's at the back there. Warren was skippering the boat that day. You should have seen his eyes. Yeah, he threw his glasses. You know why that's a problem? It's because, can you see which way the whale's going? It's coming straight at us. I promise you, your legs start shaking when you see that. And then this was before I took my next picture I'll show you, but I thought I'd got that guy all the way out of the water. Um, you know, like when a referee can't see a try because there's something in the way. Well, there's water in the way here. So I always used to say, no, that's the one. But uh, I had to wait for another, another five years. And uh, Jake and I were actually on the boat. And this whale was breaching numerous times. And I said, I, said, I went first. And then I said, you want to go? He says, yeah, no, that's fine. And he went. And then I said, I just want one more. And then that's the one I got, yeah. So he slipped up and, and I caught it. But as you see, I've actually had it printed there. If you have a look at those slides along there, I printed the canvas so it shows you the different, the different action. But 40 tons out of that thing had 300,000 hits on our Facebook page. It's crazy. That's uh, the, nasty, the nasty ported cooker. That's the oil, oil rig in there. And... If you guys were here for the disentanglement talk on Sea Rescue, when we released that whale at Blue Horizon Bay, we had, I told you, we, seen over, we saw over 100 whales. And on the way there, we didn't see one. On the way back, after the, the, the female had been released and was breaching, these guys were breaching all over the place. That was a, 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 double, a double breach, which is very difficult. And uh, these were guys at Bird Island. If you look at the one on the left, all these white marks here. <coughs> Okay, that's from killer whales. So what the killer whales do, killer whales come in packs of... Purity is going to show you a nice video just now on our last sighting, so don't run away. Um, they'll come in and the females, they'll each grab a fluke, some will grab flippers, and the, normally the male or the big female will push the, the animal down and try and drown it. All right, this one got away to live another day. I mean, trying to subdue a 40-ton animal is not, not that easy. These guys having a conference. It's a bird island. It's the one with more rake marks. You can see that got pieces actually bitten right off its flukes. And that's, uh, that's the three wise men. Yeah. Tail slapping. Could be predators. Sharks like to hang around just at the, off the back of the waves. They found out why sharks stay just behind the waves. It's because when a wave breaks, it takes air into the water and like in a circle. So if the shark just hangs around there, it gets, doesn't have to swim. It gets oxygenates its, its, its blood. So that's why they like that area. And um, so that's an interesting whale. It's not quite white, but uh, I don't know if you guys follow it, but in Australia, there was a, a white humpback whale called Migaloo. All right? And it's quite famous. It's been followed for the last, I think, 12 years or something. So we, and Megaloo in Aboriginal means white fellow. So we got this one and I thought, oh, what are we going to call it? So I called it Umlungu. <laughs> Umlungu means a white man. It's the scum, the white people that came from the ships, like the, the, the foam that comes off the sea. That's where that name is. We haven't seen that one again. <coughs> Some of my recent pictures, I got a new camera, so I'm, I went mirrorless, finally. Lovely to see these animals. Yeah, um, that one, what I did for that picture, I actually got as low as I could on the boat. And I shot sort of up like that. It makes a whale look a whole, a whole lot bigger, doesn't it? Yeah. We're almost done. Okay, there's the, the female coming back from East Africa. So she's been in East Africa for three months. The trauma of birth. Breastfeeding, about 200 liters of milk every single day. And that calf grows like two centimeters a day. It's like rocket fuel. And then it's got to leave those warm waters. The reason they go to the warm waters to give birth is because in the Antarctic where they feed, the water is only two degrees Celsius. And that's not going to, you're not going to be able to insulate yourself. The calf 
doesn't have this blubber to protect it against the cold, so it would die. That is why they come to Kenya, where the water is about between 28 and 32 degrees. All right, so it's breastfeeding, it then swim, starts the 4,000 kilometer journey. Can you imagine? 4,000 up, breastfeeding, 4,000 down. And you can see the female, she still has a lot of reserves. You see how, but when they come up, that whale is almost, it's like a tabletop. You can see it's already starting to, to, get, to get less. All right, that, that monster. It's the largest cetacean not to be called a whale. It's a Rissos dolphin. All right, you get them off here. There's one in the museum. If you go into the Oceanarium, they had a, a casting of one. So they've got all these scars on them. That's from fighting amongst themselves. And they're also deep divers. They live about 10, 20 kilometers offshore here. They grow to 3.8 meters. Cousins of theirs, those are the false killer whales. So those we saw during one of the tuna classics, the boats called us onto them. Um, and they one of the animals that actually managed to fight off killer whales. Killer whales are stronger, man for man, well, dolphin for dolphin, but these guys come in big groups and they've got more of a sharp teeth. And if a killer whale's busy with something and they come along, they'll actually chase the killer whales. It's the same what happened with Homo sapiens and the Neanderthals in Europe. The Neanderthals were big and strong, and one-on-one -on -one wipe us out. But we came with coordination and in, a, in the thousands. That's what, why we displaced them. Same with these guys. That's what one looks like up close. That guy, anyone know? These were taken in the current here. See what, how beautiful blue the water is? Those clouds that you see sometimes, you think it's a front going past. That's the warm water. You're just looking at the clouds, that, the, the moisture on that water. There we go, pilot whales. Why well, they're called pilot whales is because if one of them stranded, they all used to strand. So people said the pilot was sick and everyone else ends up on the beach. They do strand very often. You know what? These animals, we've got 25 billion neurons in our brains. Some of these false killer whales and these guys have got 20 billion neurons, and that's where they communicate. They've got parts of their brain that deal with emotions and social like attachment we don't even have. So we can't even explain why these animals do these things. They are so incredibly joined at the hip. They're like one unit. That's what they look like underwater. He's got the little, little flash on the eye. Those ones, you'll see those at Happy Valley. Off Happy Valley, Pollock Beach, that whole area up to Cape Receive. Those are the humpback dolphins. Indo Indian Ocean humpbacks. Okay? So they've got a hump on their back and then they've got the fin. And as they get older, so they get a lot whiter. They get these white patches on them. Okay, there's something wrong with this picture. That's Woody Cape, that's the alienite cliffs there, and those are Indo-Pacific dolphins. But can you see there's a pregnant Jack Russell in amongst them? Okay, that's an Indo-Pacific humpback. Humpback dolphins don't do that. They don't surf the waves. They've never been seen surfing waves. So what's happened, it's probably a female, this lot have caught her, and they'll probably just mate with her. And she's thought, well, she may as well just join in, you know, if that's what they do. And but you can see totally different body form. Here's another uh, one I took in the harbour. I only saw this when I got back. That one in the front is a... Ah, oh, here we go. No, not common. Got to hit a blank. That, that's them. Okay, you only get them up the west coast. From False Bay all the way up to Namibia. Dusky, that's a dusky dolphin. Yeah, so I don't know what that was doing in the harbour. Also, it must have been grabbed by, by another school and they took it with them and they brought it down here. There we go. Those are the common dolphins. 
absolutely amazing. You, they come in groups of between about 1,000 and 10,000. That's the size. Massive. And it's perpetual motion. If you see that white foaming water, all right, those are the common dolphins. And they eat sardines, anchovies. They use the sardine run to wean, their, to wean the calves, get the calves feeding on, them, on their own. That was, um, that was, we did this for IMAX. Uh, we had one of these long poles with a camera, and the camera was right at the bottom of that filming up. And we were doing about 20 knots, or 40 kilometers an hour, with a massive swell. These guys got the most incredible footage. And IMAX is that big, you know, 20, uh, 20 meter screen by six meters high or something. Yeah, they're evolving to fly as well. I don't know if you know that dolphins are going to be flying one of these days. That was making a documentary called Earth Flight. There's the beachfront. Has anyone ever seen common dolphins from, from the shore? You yeah. have? Okay. And that's Jake on... We've got, two, we've got three boats. Uh, the big one is my China. Because I wanted the guy in the control tower to say to me, carry on my China. Which is, hasn't happened because he's, he's retired since. But um, yeah, very nice boats. Very bi uh, large, 11 meter catamarans. We take 20 passengers. There's a toilet on there. There's nice shelter and you don't get wet. Not like the last boats we had. Uh, it was Jake and I on the radio. Okay, go a little bit forward. Okay, go back. Okay, wait. Hang on, I'm coming and to, to, to get those shots. And those are the Winterhoekberge there in the background. People always say, what mountains are those? You don't actually notice them, but when you've got a, a zoom lens, it brings the background in so much and kind of squashes it, so it looks a lot, lot nicer. There we go, that's Cape Recife, lighthouse there, common dolphins. And then we go on to this guy. So there's two kinds of bottlenose dolphins we get here. One is the Indo-Pacific. So all the way from here, from the Indian to the Pacific Ocean. And this one is what is called an offshore bottlenose dolphin. If you look at its rostrum, that's its snout, it's very short. And it's quite a, you can see it's quite a bulky dolphin. And then you get some that look like something in between the two. So we've eventually just, we, we've given up. Even the scientists, you show them a picture, they're like, no, we want a dead one. You know, it's got to be dead. <laughs> right. These guys, this is also a recent picture. Look at that smile, lovely. That's a really cool breach. Indo-Pacific bottlenose. These are the ones that we had in our aquarium here, which luckily we do not have anymore. You can't take an animal that's got a 100, a, a hundred kilometer range a day and stick it in a bathtub. You can't do that. It's unethical. And when people see them and they're smiling, they think, oh, it's happy. It's not happy. They're very unhappy. And... It's, it's keeping cetaceans in captivity that promotes things like, you know, the cove, the, the terrible thing about the cove with all those dolphins that are herded in Japan, all right, and they, they kill them and they eat them. And they, but the most money is given for the ones that are alive. They go to Mexico. They even had an a, a albino one that was put on display. That one sold. So that's why you can't go and watch at cetaceans in captivity. You're only perpetuating the violence. That's cool, eh? I love that. Oh. Just one. I always like like a hundred in, but sometimes one is good. Yeah, and uh, I don't know. We this is quite a dangerous thing to do is to get in there because you've got to get in close. And this woody cape area is uh, it's it's yeah dangerous. So we've we've we stayed a little bit further offshore now. But uh, they do it here in PE. There's a golf club. I, I thought, great, anyone from the golf club here? Okay, I, um, they asked me, can we have some pictures? So I sent them this. It was about three months. It took me, it took me like, I don't know how long to, to edit all these things, and, and they haven't ordered one. So I'm going to actually just get one made, and I'm going to take it to them and say, put this up. If you don't want to put it up, give it back to me. I mean, yeah. how, 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 what a beautiful promo for, for your golf club. So have a word with that guy. <laughs> Um, same with Cape Receive, the lighthouse. Yeah, and this, um, you know, when you go out to sea and you think, oh, it's overcast, I'm not going to get nice pictures. Think again. That was an overcast day, but with oily water. You've got these amazing, amazing reflections 
and patterns on the water. There's Woody Cape again. This one on the front has got a calf with it. Quite interesting here with this photograph is, besides the dolphins, over here, that's a shell midden. So that's from the koi. So these sand dunes move. They move like at a two to three meters a year. So eventually, they, they, where there's a Stone Age, late Stone Age site, the, the dune will cover it. And then 50 or 100 years later, it will expose it. And it's exactly like it was when it was covered up. So really cool to see that. There we go, reflections again. That one, I had my camera over the, over the side of the boat and I was resting it almost on the water and I took that picture and the sun was setting, so <coughs> sun came in from the back. And a little drop of water on the, on the rostrum there. Should I, should I say anything? <laughs> That's, that's a dolphin's winky. <laughs> so a typical male, when, he's, when he came right with one of the women, he will jump out the water and that's what they show off. Look at, his, look at that smile. I mean, check. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was cool. Yeah. And that to me is the iconic Port Elizabeth picture. You've got the pier, you've got the people, you've got the oak there from the orange free state with the lack of book. <laughs> All the kids, and there was a paddle skier or two coming past. That also got about 200,000 hits on our. It's all people sending it to their relatives overseas. Look where we live. And look where we live. Shit, we live in an amazing place. We've got to, just got to look after it. Isn't that, uh, that's quite a tongue-in-cheek one. So you've got the dolphins in the aquarium, and you've got these ones calling their mates out, you know. And the bloody Coca-Cola sign. <laughs> Yeah, you know, our bottlenose dolphins, we get schools of between, I would say, average between 50 and 600. Yeah. It's the biggest anywhere in the world. Yeah. No other place. I went to all these whale conferences and I said to the people, how many, how many bottlenose dolphins use your bay? What are the sizes of your schools? So all the dolphin scientists. And the closest we got to Algoa Bay was a place called Shark Bay in, uh, in Australia. They've got 4,000 bottlenose for six months of the year. The rest of the other six months they've got. We've got 28,500 dolphins. And the only reason they're here is because the food is here, because of the upwelling, because of the nutrients. We've got to keep them. I'm taking pictures hoping and they're not going to go like the penguins. <coughs> and those are bottlenose. Bottlenose. Indo-Pacific okay. bottlenose, yeah. That was, uh, yeah, I love that. Is, uh, I'm, being colorblind is difficult. I've always got to get someone to help me edit the color, but apparently the wave is green. Is it? Yeah. Okay, that was, that was my first one I ever took, and I had a student on the boat, and I said, just, can you drive? And she said, no. I said, well, just try. And I managed to get that picture, and I, I submitted it as the, it won the best uh, photograph taken in a, in a national park because Ada had just extended into the sea. And the prize that year was two nights accommodation at Umgeni River bungalows, which is, next, which is up in Natal, which is the most dreadful place. You know, the beds had those radios above them. You know the ones you push the button? Those things. That was my prize. And a, and a canopy tour, which was, that was cool. Guess what the prize was the next year for the best picture? It was a land cruiser. So, so I had to buy my land. I had to buy it. And that used to be my absolute <coughs> my bestest picture. And then I did this one. See if you think this is better. Oh. Yes, no? Yeah. First one. First one. Yeah. Okay, hands up. Okay, wait, wait. <laughs> so that one. Okay, hands up for this one. First one. Ah, okay, all right. <laughs> Uh, I'll change my mind. It's the first one I like most. <laughs> and there we go. So, so we decided we're going we're gonna to persuade this. This is Professor Lorian Pitchergreen, myself. Uh, the lady in the middle is the Minister of Tourism at the time. Um, the guy on the right, head of uh, East, Cape, East Cape Parks. And Man, Man Lakazi Skafila Sham, she passed away. She was head of tourism. And we pulled this whole thing off. We got a, we got a big poster. 
and we officially declared it as the bottlenose dolphin capital of the world. And I love it because I'm, I walk along the side and you see these guys sending their souvenirs and then they've got bottle bottlenose dolphin capital and it's like, yeah, yeah, boy. <laughs> right, this is, n I've never shown this at a, at a, at, a, at a, one of these presentations before, so I'm going to share this with you guys. First time at the Whale Festival. Can you see the mistake there? Yeah, yeah I just took some Tipex and just Tipex the, the, the slide. That is an albino dolphin swimming with its peers, all right? And albino. So there's two kinds of albino. There's albinos and there's something called leucistic. So leucistic is, can have little dark patches or a bit of pigment. The difference is, is that an albino person or bird or thing doesn't have the enzyme to make melanin, which is what gives you color. And a leucistic one doesn't have the melanin or it not functioning properly. So on an albino, everything is white, right, including the cornea of the eye. So when you look at an albino's eyes, it's red because the blood vessels are showing through. And this was at my son's wedding. Jamie was driving the boat, my other son. And it was the wedding party. And we came across, I, you know what I said, the F word. And I just about jumped off the roof. I got my cameras back up there. And we managed to get these amazing sequence of pictures. And has he been seen since? Um, Robbie from Stampede Tours, he managed to see him twice. And then someone saw, them, saw it from the shore. You can see there, it's on top of its mother. Mother's coming up. There we go. That's what it should, that's the normal one in the middle and the darker color of the adult. But about a month old. Problem with albinos is they stand out like a sore thumb. So any predator coming into the area just checks white and it's like on it. Whoop. So this one had already survived for a month, which is really, really, really good news. And I Googled on the, on the internet and very few pictures of these animals exist, excepting the one in the tank. The others, people have got them too far away, and we were very lucky. Um, at St. Croix Island, the dolphins like it there because it's shallow, and they protect it on one side from shark attack. So they'll hang around and sleep there. You know, they sleep with half with their brain at a time. So we were very lucky. Here we go next to its mother. There's a couple of little marks, orange or whatever color that is. We're almost there. Um, look at that. That's a reflection of the of the island. I mean, I just to me that's just so beautiful. Yeah. And it's in the marine protected area. We got hope. It's up here somewhere. If you guys want any of these pictures, you must just get all the braggy charters and we'll we'll have them made for you. Right, then the big bad wolf, that's a, that's a male killer whale. That's Schoonmarker's cop in the background there. Uh, I followed these guys for about three hours, a male and then a female, you can see, much shorter fin. That's, um, that's Sardinia Bay in the background. Now that was with the BBC, with the film crew. You can see that camera there is what we had on a couple of weeks back. It's called a shot over. They used them in Afghanistan. The camera cost two and a half million rand and the McGafter that you put it on cost five and a half million. <laughs> So, it's a, so we had an armed guy on the boat at night. <laughs> that's, uh, that's Ziggy's. I made this copy actually for the guy. We used to have the whale festival at um, Pine Lodge. But it was a bit difficult there. Um, you know, they, 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 their, their um, clients came first. We kind of came second. And Herman with Willows here, he's put us first every single time with the parking and the day people must just hang on for the, for the day. So... It's really cool that he's bent over backwards. And this is a nice venue. So, um, yeah. This was, um, this was taken about th three months ago, I think. This was the biggest school that we've ever seen of killer whales that came into bay. There was about 14 of them. Wow. It's the big male. There's a two, uh, I think that one closest uh, on, to the right, that's a, that's a sub-adult male. He's still getting fin, and the other two are female and a calf. And uh, yeah, that's what we call a rain blow, all right? When the when the whale actually makes the blow, you can see uh, you can see Port Elizabeth in the background and the university building. We're almost done. 
Okay. Um, this is what happens in the current in this 50 kilometers to 80 kilometers off here. These things come together in these big, big groups. All right? And what they do is they hunt. They hunt things. And that is a cuvier's beaked whale. It's a female. It's a, it's a six meter whale. You can imagine it's been down, it's been underwater for three hours, eating squid, using up all its oxygen. It comes to the surface and it's hello. And these lot get hold of it. All right. They'll swim along with it a bit. The females will escort it. They'll get all the other killer whales from the area coming in and the calves to say, just watch how we do this. You can see it's already had a piece taken out of it, just below that white chin petrol there. You know, you think when, you, when it's happening, so I was there and it was happening and I thought, I'm not going to enjoy this. It's pretty much like watching a lion kill. Not quite as bad as watching wild <coughs> dogs eating something while it's still alive, okay? And there they've given it a whack out the water. If you take those flippers and you take the skin off, it just looks like a pair of human hands. It's, it's, it's actually amazing. So there they've hit it out of the water. And that's the initial attack. So that's one of the big females jumping on top of it, trying to, trying to get hold of it. Is there blood in the water there? I can't see. But the birds know. The birds know something's about to happen. <coughs> Yeah, it's um, amazing. So, there we go. Okay, there's red apparently on the back. So that was a failed attempt there. But you can see the rake marks on its back. And there we go. That's uh, one grabs at the back, one grabs, and within seconds they just rip it to pieces. It's gone. And then they all share it up. And at the end of it, the matriarch, the main one out of the 50, um, she will swim around with her head, like, check what we've done, you know. Yeah. Anyway, those whales, the, the, the cuvier's beak whales are definitely not endangered. And, and what happens on these continental shelves is all these nutrients which feed the squid, you get things called colossal squid that they formed off, off here, which have got suckers this big yep. and hooks to hook on. That's what the sperm whales and these things feed on. And at the end, all that is left is some um, little bits of body organs in the sea. And um, Purity is going to show you, she made a video on this. This was our last encounter that on the way to Bird Island. Um, this was, they just had a predation. And the only reason I knew it was a predation was because you could see all the oil coming up on a big slick. And I'd seen that in Australia in two months this year. I'd seen those oily slicks. I knew they'd they predated on something. And once they've predated and they've eaten, they start performing. So now they were, the calf was in amongst them. There's another female coming at the back. They, um, yeah, that's one with the calf. Look at that little one. That's about a, how long was that one? About a meter, I think, yeah. What I never realized is that killer whales have actually got a white upper lip. This part here. Yeah, I was too lazy to put the, 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 the shorter lens on my camera, so everything was like magnified. So I actually got some interesting stuff. Um, there's the two calves having a little, little play time. On that one's fin there, it's got a barnacle. It's called a goose barnacle. You know the goose barnacles that sometimes wash up on, uh, on bits of driftwood and plastic and what have you? They get the same things on their, on their flippers. So they, they don't parasite, but they, they get free transport. <laughs> and yeah, there was one upside down. Yeah, and how fitting. We, these are the, this is Scion, so they do the marine research. They were leading us to some common dolphins, and on the, after about 10 minutes of going towards their position, we said, hey, guys, we've got killer whales. So they turned and they came to us um, and managed to, to photograph them. Anyone know what that is? It's a killer whale, and his name is Port. And the reason it's Port is because his dorsal fin isn't straight up, it curls to the left. On, on the boat, your left is your port. So that's port. 
And that is? Starboard. Starboard. Right. His one is going the other way. These guys were probably shot at by the long liners or had thunder flashes thrown at them or something. And they specialize in sharks. These guys eat white sharks. That's what they do. Okay, that's where they normally stay. They normally stay in, uh, that's False Bay, Cape, Cape Point. But we've seen them here on three occasions. So they do come here. And I'm sure they do go down to, to Bird Island. So that's what Bird Island looks like. We're doing the research on the sharks there. And that was, as Jake put it, Lloyd, we're going to be the, we were the first people to ever get a shark breaching. No one can be the first again. And I only realized, oh, okay. Quite interesting. When they hit a, when they hit a seal, you see the eye is white. Okay, so what they've evolved, they've got these muscles attached to the eye. And as their mouth opens to go and hit a seal, it pulls the business end of the eye away. The lens and the cornea get pulled into the socket. So when a whale tries to fight back, all it gets is the white part of the eye. Because without vision, these guys, that's the end of, it's the end of it for them. So what do they do to the white sharks? Well, they swim up to them. They give them one snot club, <laughs> all right? And they turn them upside down. And if you turn a shark upside down, it's called tonic immobility. It doesn't move. And then they each grab one of the dorsal fins. They know this because they've x-rayed the dorsal fins. They've got these pressure marks from these killer whales. They've got flat teeth because the shark skin um, wears it down. And that's what they do. So they rip that stomach cavity open and out comes the liver. That's all they eat. Sometimes the heart, but mainly just the liver. Liver is huge. It's used for buoyancy. It's used as an energy store. And they will then share that liver. Um, I'm just going to show you two clips. Uh, everyone's been asking about the sardine run. That we've, that's just starting to move off. These are just, it's very amateurish. Purities will be much better, but let me just show you quick. That's our boat in the front there, and you can see they're diving pretty, pretty, pretty shallow. Okay, Crazy, eh? There's one more. In this one, you'll see two brides whales feeding, so they're coming from the left of the screen to the right. Another one. I told you that Algoa Bay has been declared a whale heritage site. There's a quick video. You guys are free to leave if you need to go. I'm just going to quick, it's like about eight minutes long, and then we're going to show you Purity's one on the killer whales, but just quickly so you know what this is all about. My name is Lloyd Edwards. I'm the owner, skipper and guide of Raggy Charters and I also run the Baywatch Marine Conservation Project which was started 30 years ago and is probably the oldest privately funded marine conservation project in Africa. So today we are on Bird Island in the eastern extremity of Algoa Bay and it's the centre of the Greater Addo Marine Protected Area. We're on a whale and dolphin viewing trip. Algoa Bay is probably one of the best places in the world to view whales and dolphins because of the huge diversity of species and the actual abundance of them. Algoa Bay is also known as the bottlenose dolphin capital of the world and we have about 28,500 dolphins that use the bay. So finding dolphins in our bay is a 99% hit rate. I'm Piri Tikosa and I'm a marine tour guide with Reggie Tatters. So we see a lot of cetaceans, for example the Indo-Pacific bullnose dolphins. We also see a lot of migratory whales and penguins. In June 2021, Algoa Bay became the second site in South Africa to be awarded whale heritage site status, a global accreditation scheme for responsible wildlife friendly tourism experiences developed by the World Cetacean Alliance and supported by World Animal Protection. The Whale Heritage Site initiative is really, well it's a certification program, that's the first thing we should say, but it's, it's about sites, it's about destinations, and it's really about responsible tourism, and particularly responsible, sustainable whale and dolphin watching tourism. 
We call it the gold standard for global whale watching. If you go to a whale heritage site, you can be sure that the trip that you would take to see these animals really puts the animals first. It puts their welfare and their conservation first. And that is a wonderful thing. It's critical for us to be accredited as a whale heritage site because tourists, they want to know that they are supporting tour operators that are looking after the interests of the whales and dolphins in their area. When they're with us, they can see that we've built up an amazing amount of knowledge in the last 24 years. Um, they can feel our passion. They know that we've got this great accreditation and it allows them to be more trustworthy in this and by the end of the day, they get a much, much better experience. We view whale heritage sites as the future for whale and dolphin tourism, really. You know, the days of going to see these animals in captivity and in confinement should be coming to an end. Captive whales and dolphins spend their entire lives in small barren tanks, performing unnatural and demeaning tricks in exchange for food. Dolphins are intelligent wild animals, and so their confinement in use and entertainment is highly unethical. You're going to learn nothing about these animals in a tank. You're not seeing them behaving normally. You're not seeing the environment that they live in. Instead, why not go to a whale heritage site where the people really care about these animals and that is obvious. We know that the years of having dolphins and other cetacean species and things in captivity is becoming a thing of the past and we're progressing. We, why not come and see them in a natural habitat that is not uh, manufactured by training? The difference between seeing a whale and a dolphin in captivity and in the wild is absolutely huge. When you see it in the wild, you see it at work in its natural day, interacting with each other, fighting with each other, playing with each other, surfing the waves. It's incredible to see the, the, the speed at which they can move. They, they're so alive, they're so intelligent, they're so in tune with nature. I like watching the visitors because to see the expression on their faces is absolutely incredible. And with dolphins, they just never get tired of them. Today was a beautiful day in Algoa Bay and uh, it was a tremendous uh, event. Dolphins are such a beautiful, beautiful animal and we saw them diving out of the waves and the catching waves. The dolphins are always the highlight of this trip.